All right, today we are moving into the biochem section of the course. We are officially done with the elementary organic half. We're moving into the elementary biochem half of the course. And so we're gonna talk about four major classes of biomolecules. You're probably familiar with these from your biology courses or previous other science classes. We've got our lipids, which is what we'll do today. We'll do some enrichment on this week as well. We'll do carbohydrates next, proteins, nucleic acids. Okay, so these are the four major classes we're gonna look at in great detail. We're gonna do a ton with the others. Lipids, we'll do today and uh, Wednesday, and then we're gonna focus really heavily on these other guys. Lipids is a lot of vocab. Just gonna warn you right now, heavy, heavy, heavy in the vocabulary today. So make a vocab list, uh, keep track of all your families, because that's the big thing about lipids. When we classify lipids, there are four families that you're responsible for being able to identify. So we're gonna talk about all four of these today. We're also gonna talk about the cell membrane today, which I think is probably a review for most people. I'm talking about the cell membrane, something that I think everybody's covered at some point in your past. So we're just gonna review that. All right, so this is a figure from a textbook. Our four families are fatty acids, glycerides, non-glycerides, and complex lipids. Um, and so the way we classify lipids is by their structure, right? By their structure and also by their parent molecule. What parent molecule are these lipids being synthesized from? And you know, you can download these files from the course website, so if you don't wanna write them all down, this, this handout is on uh, the course website. So let's talk about a distinction we need to talk about before we get into any other details. And that's what's the difference in a fat versus an oil. Those two words get thrown around a lot in our culture. Let's talk about, excuse me, what they are. Primarily when we say fat, we're referring to an animal. And I mean, I guess fish is considered an animal too. But your book makes a point of distinguishing that because uh, some fishes produce oils as well. So you get fats from fish, but you can also get some oils from fish. And most fats are solid at room temperature. Primarily when we're talking about a fat, we're talking about something that is solid at room temperature and is coming from an animal. Oils, on the other hand, are primarily coming from plants, plant-based. Again, you can get some of those oils from fish. If you've ever had the pleasure of uh, taking fish oil as a supplement, it's, it's a liquid at room temperature and it stinks. It's disgusting stuff. Um, and it's a liquid at room temperature. So if you've ever uh, been around fish oil, boy, it stinks. They uh, <laughs> had to give that to my kids a couple times as a supplement. And um, you add like lemon flavor to it and it just, just imagine like the fishiest, most disgusting fishy flavor combined with like lemon. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's disgusting. Ugh. All right, so let's talk about fatty acids. This is actually the last organic sub, I mean, the last organic functional group that we learn. Do you remember what functional groups in fatty acid? It's a carboxylic acid, right? A fatty acid, as we talked about when we did the organic description of carboxylic acids, a carboxylic acid that's really long and linear, we call that a fatty acid. So there's no appreciable difference between a carboxylic acid and a fatty acid in terms of the chemistry, right? It's just a long carboxylic acid to be called a fatty acid. Now these can be saturated or unsaturated. And here's a, um, a word you're gonna see thrown around a lot. It's uh, essential. What does that word mean? Now I know you say essential, you think necessary for life, and that's true. But when we use that word in a biochem setting, we're talking about this is something that we can't synthesize ourselves, right? So if we're talking about an essential fatty acid, we'll see it in amino acids too, essential amino acids. Our bodies have biopathways to make a lot of things that we need to survive. However, some of the things that we can't make ourselves, we can't manufacture internally, we call them essential. So they have to come from our diet. Okay, so if you see the word essential in front of fatty acid or essential amino acid, we're talking about a fatty acid or amino acid that we can't manufacture ourselves. It has to come from our diet. 
So if we're talking about saturated and unsaturated fatty acids, that's no different than when we were talking about saturated and unsaturated alkanes, right? Saturated means it contains no double bonds, all carbon-carbon single bonds, right? So these are your saturated fats. And then your unsaturated fats means you've got at least one double bond, if not more, but you have to have at least one for it to be considered unsaturated. And normally those double bonds are cis. They're not trans. Normally they're cis. But of course, you do see trans fats. Look at your labels. They do exist. So here's an example of two 18 carbon fatty acids. One of them is saturated, one of them is unsaturated. All right, so here's your carboxyl group. You've still got the COOH, you've still got the COOH. So again, this is a molecule that last week, if I had given this to you, I said, what is it? You would have just said it's a carboxylic acid. Would you expect this to be soluble in water? No way, right? This is 18 carbon chain. This one, same thing. Are these two gonna have different boiling points? Yes, right? This one is gonna stack differently than this one, right? This is gonna have a kink in it, right? It's not gonna stack on top of each other the same way that this one will. So they're both 18 carbon carboxylic acids. This one's got a uh, double bond, right? Makes that kink. It's a cis configuration, whereas this one's all single bonds. And so if we call something monounsaturated, mono meaning one, right? There's only one double bond. Polyunsaturated means you've got obviously more than one double bond. And cis is more common than trans. Right? So here's oleic acid, and then there it is in the trans configuration. This is what the cis would look like, right? This is kinks. Remember, during a double bond, it's linear. So you've got your zigzags, and then all of a sudden, it gets linear. So if you've got lots of these, right, it's gonna really change the shape. And this is a figure from your textbook just showing you some mono and poly, uh, fat, uh, excuse me, mono and, po mono and poly unsaturated fatty acids, right? So butter, olives and corn, soybeans, meat, eggs and fish, etc. This is all coming just straight from the textbook. I wouldn't make you memorize this kind of thing, but just so you can see, right? You've got lots and lots and lots of double bonds in this one. Several double bonds here, several double bonds here. And again, because these linear portions make a, a kink, right? It, it, instead of being zigzaggy continuously, it's got that linear point. They don't pack as closely, right? And so that's what's gonna cause them to be the liquid at room temperature, right? Saturated fats are solids at room temperature because they can stack on top of each other nice and neat. They've got stronger London forces than these ones that can't stack nice and neat, right? This is what causes unsaturated fats to be liquids at room temperature versus saturated fats are solids at room temperature, right? So if we're talking about, you know, animal fat, we're, we're carrying around lots of that. It's the solid at room temperature. Uh, so again, stack nice and neat, strong London forces. These are a lot more stackable, right? That's what gives them their higher melting points. And again, just a figure from your textbooks summarizing some of the places you can find these fats, animal fats, stearic acid. And this is what I just said. It increases with the carbon number, which is something you already knew, right? Because the longer the chain, the longer the London, the higher the London forces are. Um, and so here's some data to represent that. Right? There's room temperature. And so there's our room temperature point, and then this is looking at the melting point. As the as the chain increases, melting point goes with it, right? And so we can use the same notation we used in organic chem, right? COOH or CO2H, right? You can just use CH2 in parentheses and then the 10 saying, so you don't have to draw out all those CH2s. You can still use your skeleton notation. And so, kind of just a review at this point. We ever talked about omega-3 and omega-6? We ever heard those words before? Especially if you're, um, Taking those supplements, the fish oil one comes to mind, right? So why is it called that? That is not a IUPAC name, okay? The omega, omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, right? And so omega-3 
means you're counting three from the end of the molecule. And omega-6 means you're counting six from the end of the molecule to get to your first double bond. Okay, so this is not IUPAC nomenclature. So here's a picture. Okay. Here's an omega-6. You count six from the end to get to your first double bond. You count six from the end to get to your first double bond. We're not counting from the carboxyl. We're counting from the end, right? Remember, just remember the Greek letter. Omega is the last letter. It's like Z, right? It's the last letter of our alphabet, so think end. Because this is definitely carbon number one, right? So count from the end. Six from the end to get you to our first double bond is omega-6. Six. six from the end to get you to first double bond is omega-3. And you usually think about fish. I take a fish oil supplement. That's something you're supposed to take when you're pregnant, too. Okay, so there's an omega-6. There's an omega-3. And then this is one of the ones that's actually in, um, actually both of these are in your pregnancy prenatal vitamins to help with the brain development and all that great stuff. So I'm not going to pause the recording and make you do this, but how would you do it? Let's just talk about it. A 10 carbon fatty acid that is saturated. We can just do it together. How would you draw a 10 carbon fatty acid that's saturated? What would it look like? All single bonds. All single bonds, right? So you've got your carboxyl group. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Because that counts as carbon number one. There you go. Okay, so monounsaturated omega-3. How will we turn this into a monounsaturated? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's omega three. So where is the double bond? Three from the end, right? So one, two, three gets me to my first double bond. And then monounsaturated omega six. What would that look like? Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Remember, this omega three and omega six business is not IUPAC. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? When we're naming this in terms of IUPAC rules, that's not what we're going to name this molecule. But do we see how to do it? Feel good about how to identify it? All right. All right, let's talk about a subgroup of the fatty acids, which are called the icosanoids. Icosanoids. Now, again, one of the ways we talk about fats is by their parent molecules, right? So this is a carboxylic acid. It's just drawn, bent around on itself, right? It's, this is still a carboxylic acid. It's just got four double bonds. So if you just imagine the rest of the molecule, that's what it would look like linear. All right, so arachidonic acid is the precursor for all these icosanoids, and they have a lot of roles in the body, a lot of different roles, and I'm not gonna make you memorize them. But if you're a person who's interested in medicine, right, a lot of the things that uh, carry it out in our bodies are regulated by some of these molecules. And one of those families of the icosanoids, uh, there's all six of them, one of those that is regulated by an acosanoid that I just want to point out because I think it's kind of interesting is the prostaglandin family. So prostaglandins are involved in inflammation. So they're an icosanoid involved in inflammation. And the reason I want to look at them specifically, I think it's just kind of a neat story. So because these all have the same parent molecule, they're all going to have similar structures, right? And all of these guys are all prostaglandins. So you can tell it's a prostaglandin because notice it's got a five carbon ring and then it's still a carboxyl group on the end and then this just kind of sort of makes it cyclic right here. But notice you've got the same family, right? So if I gave you this and said, all right, didn't give you the name, what family does this come from, right? It would technically be a fatty acid and then what subfamily would it be? it would be part of the prostaglandin family, right? 
So that's something that I could do on a test. And that's really the only way I could test you <laughs> on a lot of these uh, lipids kind of stuff is there's just a lot of memorization with lipids. All right, so this, they all have similar structures because they're all part of the same family. And the reason I picked prostaglandins as the one to look at because mycosinoids are involved in a lot of different things. Prostaglandins are involved in inflammation, fevers, etc. But they're not produced when you take something like aspirin. And so that's kind of neat, right? We're talking about a like, chemist. If you take aspirin, you're preventing these prostaglandins from forming. And so here's a figure from your textbook, right? If you smash your finger with a hammer, that would hurt. That would not be fun, right? There's arachidonic acid. That's the precursor. And your cells are now injured. Ow! You're saying select words, right? This is painful. Arachidonic acid is not converted into this prostaglandin, right, which would lead to the inflammation. So if you take aspirin or whatever other um, anti-inflammatory, right, this process doesn't occur and you don't get the inflammation. So that's why I picked that one, okay? But there are tons of other ways that icosinoids have a role in the body. I'm not going to make you memorize them all. I just wanted to look at the prostaglandins specifically because I think the inflammation story is pretty, pretty fun. Right? So these are all prostaglandins. They're a member of the fatty acid family. Right? And they all have a characteristic structure. Make sense? All right. So that's the figure from your book. Let's talk about glycerides. So all the fatty acids were long chain carboxylic acids, right? That's the family story there. Let's talk about glycerides. Again, because every family of lipids has its own precursor, they're all going to have similar structures, right? All of our fatty acids were long chain carboxylic acids. And yes, there were modifications to that, but they all have that same sort of look to them. Glycerides are going to have the same thing. Glycerides come from glycerol, right? Now you could name this in terms of IUPAC. You could use your IUPAC nomenclature here, right? One, two, three, propatriol is the name of this. One, two, three, propatriol, right? So that's glycerol. And so glycerol is the parent molecule for all of our glycerides, hence the name, right? So it's a propane with three OHs, that's glycerol. That's the parent molecule for all glycerides. That's definitely something you would need to know for an exam. Because if they all have the same parent molecule, they're all gonna have similar family characteristics. So what happens to turn glycerol into a glyceride? This is an interesting story too. So it's an esterification reaction, yay. So if you take an alcohol and you react it with a carboxylic acid, think back to last week, right? Alcohol plus carboxylic acid, that gives you an ester, right? So you can esterify this OH and get a monoglyceride. You could esterify them both and get a diglyceride, or you could esterify all three and get a triglyceride. Right? So you can have esterification of one, two, or all three OHs, and that'll give you mono versus di versus triglycerides. Have we heard of any of these before? I think you've probably heard of triglycerides the most, right? That's considered your blood fat. So triglycerides are something that when you go to the doctor for your yearly physical, that's usually something your doctor looks at, how much... Uh, blood fat, essentially, how much of that you got going on through your blood. Another modification that we can take to a glyceride is instead of having three fatty acids, we can have two fatty acids and a phosphate group, and that would give us a phosphoglyceride or a phospholipid, right? And this is a big part of the cell membrane, which, excuse me, we'll talk about today. So if I gave you this, oh, I probably wouldn't. Oh, yeah, I could give you any one of these. There's a generic phosphoglyceride. How do you know it's a phosphoglyceride? It's got a phosphate group, and then two of them have been esterified. 
Or maybe I gave you, instead of having a phosphate group here, maybe it's just straight up OH, right? And I said, what is that? You would call it a diglyceride, right? Or maybe instead of having this modified phosphate, I had this, 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 all three of them the same. You would say that's a triglyceride, right? So again, that's the thing that we're doing with the lipids. There's a lot of memorization of families, right? Identifying families. Or if I gave you this molecule and said, what's the parent molecule here? Right? The parent molecule would be glycerol. And so when we talk about the cell membrane, which we'll talk about here at the end of this lecture, we'll see that in a lot of uh, detail. Now let's talk about some non-glyceride lipids. All right? If glycerides come from glycerol, fatty acids are all long chain carboxylic acids. Okay, that's two families we've talked about, right? A non-glyceride means that it's a lipid coming from something other than glycerol, right? And there are three subgroups here that we're gonna be responsible for identifying. There are the sphingolipids, the steroids, and the waxes. Sphingolipids, steroids, and waxes. So these are all fatty, I mean, these are all fats that don't come from glycerol, and they're not fatty acids either. They're their own family, right? That's why they're called non-glycerides. Sphingolipids, steroids, and waxes. So let's talk about the sphingolipids first. Sphingolipids. They come from sphingosine, that's this molecule. I wouldn't make you draw it. Right? But sphingosine has a long chain, it's got an amine, it's got an alcohol. So it's got a non-polar region, big long chain here, and then it's got two polar regions, right? <coughs> That's the parent molecule, sphingosine, hence the name sphingolipids. And what do sphingolipids do? Well, the most important one that I want you to focus on, think back to your biology, even your psychology classes. Right? What's the myelin sheath? What's its job? Do you remember? It's fat. It insulates the nerve cells, right? And so if you have problems with your myelin sheath, that causes a lot of neurological problems. Right? There are a lot of, lot of conditions that are a result of problems with your myelin sheath, like neurological problems, right? So the myelin sheath is one of the many places you find sphingolipids, but that's the one I want you to focus on. I'm trying to tie it to other courses you know stuff about. Right? If you take up any generic psychology textbook and you talk about how the brain works or how the nervous system works, right? you see this very classic picture of a nervous cell. Right? And that myelin sheath is made out of sphingolipids. Sphingomyelin to be specific. Now that's not the only place you find sphingolipids, but that's the one I want you to focus on. Okay, we're not here to memorize every detail about every lipid ever, because remember, this is still an elementary level class. But just to tie it to things that I think you're familiar with. And so there are a lot of diseases that are related to sphingolipid disorders. Right? There's a lot of them that we can tie back to problems with those sphingolipids. All right, let's talk about steroids. Now, when you hear steroids, first thing comes to mind is like big muscles, raging, Incredible Hulk kind of personality, right? But is that the only function of steroids? No. I mean, we're, we're walking around right now, and our body is being regulated using steroids. So steroids are incredibly important. It's not just something that bodybuilders and athletes get busted for using. All right, steroids come from isoprene. So a lot of times you'll hear a steroid called an isoprenoid. Now what's the IUPAC name for isoprene? Let's review. Ooh, we're going to name this. Because you can name this molecule, right? That's something you know how to do. Where your, your choices for carbon number one are here, here, here. Where are we going to name this? 
two methyl, one, three butadiene, right? We're gonna name it from here, one, two, three, four, right? Because we wanna give the lowest numbers to our double bonds, all right? So one, two, three, four, two methyl, and then one, three butadiene. So that's the IUPAC name, but the common name is isoprene. That's the parent molecule for all steroids. So you sometimes hear them called isoprenoids because they're based on isoprene, right? Which has the IUPAC name 2-methyl-1,3-butadiene. I mean, if you're gonna be a future MD or pharmacist, or you're gonna take courses on this, right? Whole courses on steroids. So this is just literally scratching the surface. All steroids have this same, we call it steroid nucleus. Okay, so if I give you any steroid, you should be able to identify what family it is in a snap. Because it's three six-membered rings and one five-membered ring fused together. Okay, so I'm not gonna make you memorize well, what does progesterone look like versus cholesterol. Right? I'm not gonna make you memorize that. But if I gave you a generic steroid, didn't tell you what it was, and said, what family is this? Well, it's a steroid, and steroids are members of the non-glyceride lipids, right? So you'd have to know two things about it. You need to know that it's a steroid, and then, okay, great. What family do steroids come from, right? They come from the non-glyceride non lipids. All steroids have the same parent molecule, which is isoprene. Not glycerol, right? That's what makes them non-glyceride lipids. So cholesterol is a really important precursor in our body. We can get a lot of our steroids that we carry out for important functions. From cholesterol so these are all steroids that are derived from cholesterol here's cholesterol down here right there's the structure of cholesterol and notice it's the parent molecule to all of these steroids do you recognize the names of any of these cholesterol, hmm? cholesterol. cholesterol is the parent molecule yep and it's the parent molecule for testosterone, it's the parent molecule for progesterone. But there are a lot of really important molecules. Um, we ladies definitely take a great interest in progesterone, right? That's a big part of the female monthly cycle and um, maintaining pregnancy, especially in your first trimester. So that's a really, really, really important molecule for us, right? But women have testosterone as well, so don't just think, oh, dudes only have that, right? We have it too. And dudes also have progesterone too. But they're all coming from this cholesterol parent molecule. Right? Cells are efficient. We want to find a way to use the same parent molecule to make as many other molecules as we can so that we can be more efficient, so we don't have to do the same work over and over and over again, right? If multiple molecules can come from the same parent, that's more efficient, that's easier for the cell to manage. All right, non-glyceride group number three would be the waxes. Waxes, what comes to mind when you think about a wax? What's the job of a wax? Any thoughts? First thing that I think about is protection, right? So protecting, protecting your skin, protecting plants, right? All of these are the jobs that a, a wax can carry out, right? They're not based on glycerol, they come from alcohols, so small chain alcohol molecules. Carnuba wax, put that on your car. Beeswax, earwax, right? Lots of waxes <coughs> serving to protect, protecting skin, protecting fur. And they're not coming from glycerol, they're coming from small alcohols, so short chain alcohol molecules. All right, the next lipid family we need to talk about 
will be the complex lipids. Now, before we get into complex lipids, I want to go back to cholesterol real quick and point something out. Okay, cholesterol is what family? Cholesterol is a steroid, right? Cholesterol, the molecule, is a steroid. And steroids come from isoprene, right? Okay, this is an important thing to note. When you go to the doctor to have your cholesterol measured, your doctor is not measuring the concentration of this molecule right here. It is not measuring this, okay? What is being measured has to do with our complex lipids. So I wanna make a point of um, distinguishing that fact, okay? Because cholesterol is not the same thing as the cholesterol test you get at your doctor's office. I wanna point that out so there's no confusion, okay? Cholesterol is a steroid, it's this molecule right here. If you go get your cholesterol measured, you are not getting the molar concentration of that. What are you getting? You're measuring, the con you're measuring the amount of these complex lipids that you have. Okay, so a complex lipid is when you've got lipid plus other molecules. So it's usually proteins, okay? It's usually proteins. So a complex lipid contains those phospholipids and the molecule cholesterol, molecule cholesterol, plus protein. And there are three, or excuse me, four types of lipoproteins. And this is actually what your doctor's measuring. Okay, I'm gonna show you the picture first. Because this, I think, speaks volumes. When you go to the doctor, right, and you have your cholesterol test, quote unquote, you are not getting a concentration of the molecule cholesterol. What you're doing is you're getting a breakdown of which which ones you have the greatest proportions of, right? This is your LDL, low density lipoprotein. Here's your HDL, high density lipoprotein, right? And that's what your doctor's looking at. It's not looking, he's, he or she's not looking at the concentration of cholesterol in the molecule. He or she's looking at the proportions of these. These are actually lipoproteins. They're not cholesterol in the molecule, right? So what's the lipoprotein composed of? It's composed of a phospholipid, Right, so that's a, that's a modified, remember you, we just talked about this a few minutes ago. You take glycerol and you esterify two of them, and then you make a phosphate group as the third. That's a phospholipid, so that's what this part looks like. This little purple, okay, that's protein. And then these are actual cholesterol molecules. Right, so, well, these ones right here, actual cholesterol molecule. And then there's a triglyceride group. Right, so that whole collective thing is a complex lipid, right? So that's low DL. What's the difference between low DL, uh, LDL and HDL? It's the proportion of protein, right? The ratio of phospholipid to protein, right? 20 versus 30 and 25 versus 45, right? And then there's very low density, lipoprotein, VLDL, and then this is a chylomicron. So I wanted to go straight to the picture first because I think that really solidifies it. So the general structure is you've got your phospholipids, right? So this is a um, glycerol that's been esterified in two locations plus a phosphate group. And then you've got some protein in there, and then you've got actual cholesterol molecules with some ester on them and some triglycerides go around, right? And then the proportion of these is what gives you your LDL versus your HDL versus your VLDL. And then the job comes from the portion, right? So the chylomicrons are the lowest density and they transport stuff from your intestines to your adipose, your fat cells, right? Your VLDLs transport lipids as well. Your LDLs, carry cholesterol, and your HDL is the one that's kind of like a scavenger. It goes around and finds all that stuff that's just there, right? We think of that as your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol. So do we understand what we're actually measuring when you have a cholesterol test, right? You're not actually measuring, okay, the molar concentration of the cholesterol molecule is, that's not what's going on, okay? 
And it's confusing when you think about it as a chemist, because when you hear, oh, I'm having a cholesterol test, what you're actually looking at are these guys, right? The proportions of these complex lipids, which are composed of the phospholipids, the protein, and the cholesterol molecule itself, plus triglyceride. And the different proportions determine which one you're actually dealing with. So that being said, that leads us into the cell membrane which I think is something that uh, a lot of people have familiarity with. We want to make sure to talk about it, just to make sure, in case it's been a while since our last discussion on the cell membrane, that we've brought everybody up to speed. So what's the purpose of the cell membrane? It's to separate the cell from the external environment. Right? It's not the same thing as the cell wall, because we're not plants. Right? We don't have cell walls. There's a phospholipid bilayer plus a whole bunch of other stuff, right? It's not just a simple phospholipid bilayer. A lot of textbooks oversimplify the cell membrane and just draw it as this two-layer kind of business, right? But it's not just a phospholipid bilayer. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. So let's talk about what that stuff is. So what is the phospholipid we're talking about? Again, it's a glycerol that's been esterified in two locations, and then the third location has a phosphate group. Right? So that phosphate, think back to gen chem, intro chem, phosphate's extremely polar. Right? So this end wants to be out near water. These long chain fatty acids, do they want anything to do with water? No, they're nonpolar. Right? So they're gonna all face in. Right? And so that's what gives you the bilayer. Because if this is an aqueous environment and this is an aqueous environment, basic laws of intermolecular forces say, all right, nonpolar wants to be together, polar wants to be together. Right? So this will happen without really you doing anything, right? Non -spontane spontaneously. So you've got your hydrophobic interior right, represented here. So all your nonpolar molecules can dissolve in it. Whatever you want to dissolve in that, you can have dissolved in there. And then any sort of polar molecule you want sticking out, right, will stick out the top. And so a lot of cell membranes have molecules sticking out the top used in identifying the cell, used in a whole bunch of other purposes. Okay, so it's not just naked here on the top. Right? If you see a textbook that just shows this nice little list of circles, your textbook has way oversimplified it, right? Because it's not just this naked surface. There's molecules sticking out, used in identifying the cell, which I think you probably know from your previous biology experiences. And then there are also proteins in the cell membranes. I think you probably know that from your biology experiences, right? And there are two types. There are the integral proteins and the peripheral proteins. Now we haven't talked about proteins specifically yet, but we will very soon. Integral proteins go uh, through the membrane, whereas peripheral proteins are just on one side. So they're either on the exterior or on the interior. So here's some pictures, right? This would be a peripheral protein. It's only on one side. This would be a peripheral protein, again, only on one side. Whereas these ones that extend all the way through, those are the integral proteins, right? They are integrated in. And this is what we call the fluid mosaic model. I'm sure you've probably heard that before, right? It's not rigid, it's not a crystalline solid, right? This is moving, it's fluid, right? That's what we talk about by fluid. Mosaic means composed of lots of things, right? So your cell membrane is not this. If you see this, that's way too oversimplified. If you're looking at like a fourth grade textbook, sure, that's a great way to explain it to a fourth grader, right? But that's not what the cell membrane looks like. It's, a, it's much more complicated than just a few little layers, right? Because you've got all sorts of stuff dissolved in the middle. You've got all sorts of stuff sticking out in identification and other roles. You've got your proteins either integral, meaning going all the way through, or peripheral, just on one side. And what do those proteins do? Do you remember what their job is? They transport, right. Especially these guys, right? 
So when we talk about getting stuff in and out of the cell, there are three choices we have. We can have just simple diffusion right, for small molecules. So if the concentration, for instance, we're talking about salt, right, Na+, plus, K+, plus, et cetera, very small. That can just simple diffusion, right? Concentration inside versus concentration outside. That'll just flow in. We've got facilitated transport, right, which means it just goes through the protein channel if it's too big to simple diffuse. Or maybe you've got something where you're going against the gradient, maybe. So if you go from high concentration to low concentration, that's diffusion. That happens without any work, right? But what if you want to go against the gradient? What if it's high concentration outside, low concentration inside, and you want to make it even lower, right? That's not going to happen spontaneously. That's going to require effort. So that's one of the things that a protein can do as well, right? It has to use some cellular energy to do that because it's non-spontaneous, that doesn't happen on its own, right? It spontaneously goes from high to low, but if you wanna make it go out, kick something out against the gradient, you've gotta use some energy, and you've gotta use a membrane protein to do that, All right? So do we remember this from biology? So, like I said, today is primarily vocab, and lots of it. So what I want to do real quick, just to kind of summarize, I'm going to move this file down so that I can write. Let's just summarize here. We can write directly on our notes. So what are fatty acids? All right, these are long linear carboxylic acids. All right, so they could either be all right, they could be saturated, they could be unsaturated, right? Here's one that's saturated, here's one that's unsaturated. Okay, so that's a picture for here, and that's a picture for here. All right, and then there's a family within the fatty acids that we talked about today as well. What was that family that we discussed? Mm -hmm. I. I carcinoids. And they come from arachidonic acid. Which is unsaturated. So technically these are not their own family. They are part of the unsaturated family. I should have drawn it like this. And then in that family, we looked at do you remember? I just smashed my finger, and now I need to go take some aspirin. Oh, um, prostaglandins, right. Now prostaglandins do a whole lot of other things, but we looked at, we looked at prostaglandins specifically because if you want to prevent them, you can go take some aspirin, right? And that cellular reaction doesn't happen. And the prostaglandins all have a characteristic shape You've got a five-membered ring, and then you've got some sort of right. You've got some sort of modification going on here. You've got some double bonds in the picture. All right, they've all got that characteristic family. There's the five-membered ring, and there are two long tails with a carboxyl group, and then there's some modifications that can be along the way. But that's the generic. Family picture, right? And that's the family for the prostaglandins. Mm -hmm. And the prostaglandins are part of the icosanoids. So, like I said, there are a gazillion things that we could talk about. I try to pick the one that is most relevant to things that you've learned in other classes. So, if we were trying to clean this up a little bit, right, there would be our 
They're saturated. And there's unsaturated. Right, if we're trying to clean this up a little bit. All right, let's talk about glycerides. What's the parent molecule here? Glycerol, right? So that's this guy. Right. We didn't really distinguish between neutral versus polar. Neutral just means that you've esterified it with three long chains. Right, so you've got your mono dye and tri. So in the mono monoglyceride, if I even I could even just ask you to sketch a sketch a monoglyceride, right? You would take glycerol and you would say, okay, here's my three carbon chain. Right, there's OH, there's OH, and then oops, put that in the wrong place. And then obviously you need to fill in your hydrogens, right? How many bonds do I need to have here? One, two, three, four, right? That would be a monoglyceride. And if I said make this into a diglyceride, there would be a diglyceride. You uh, esterify two of them. Right, and if I said make it into a triglyceride, you would do that. If I said make it into a phosphoglyceride, the simplest one would just be that. Right, phosphate group. And then the two other ones are still esterified. So that's what this is talking about. Neutral is just the monodiatride. There's no charge, whereas Polar ones are the phosphoglycerides, right? Because that's got a charge. Make sense? Okay, in our non glyceride lipids, so these are all lipids from something other than uh, glycerol or uh, fatty acid, hence the name, right? So sphingolipids come from, do you remember? Sphingosine, right. And the only one that I wanted you to focus on were the sphingomyelins. What was their job? Insulation of what? Right, nerve cells. Insulation. Just think back to your general psychology class. Okay, what are your steroids coming from? What parent molecule do we have for steroids? No, that's what the steroid nucleus looks like. The parent is isoprene. Remember, it is this guy. 2-methyl-1,3-butadiene. That's isoprene. And so, yes, they all have the same shape. They all have the generic steroid nucleus. So it's a six-membered ring, a six-membered ring, a six-membered ring and a five-membered ring, All right? That's the steroid nucleus. So any sort of steroid I give you is gonna have that sort of shape, right? Obviously, they're gonna be stuff sticking out, R groups, etc. But they're all gonna have that shape. 
right? And a lot of steroids to us of biological significance come from cholesterol, which I will make you memorize the specific structure of cholesterol. But if I gave it to you, right, you said, what's this molecule? You should be able to identify it as a steroid because they all have that parent molecule, right? Three six-membered rings and one five-membered ring. And then what's the parent molecule for your waxes? These are small alcohols. Right, so your carnauba wax and your beeswax and your earwax and all those other waxes. Right, their job is protection. Primary jobs, protection, waterproofing, etc. And there were no specific structures that you had to learn for the waxes. Just know that their job primarily is to protect. And then your complex lipids and lipoproteins, we kind of lump those two together because they go together. So what are these? These are composed of what? Okay, so we have phospholipid, we have protein, and we have cholesterol, the molecule. This is cholesterol. plus triglycerides. So remember the picture that we drew? If you were to draw a lipoprotein, right, you've got your, these are all your lipoprotein, I mean these are all your phospholipids. I'm gonna try to draw a little one here. And then there are the tails. And then there are places where there's protein. That's replaced some of those, All right? So you've got your LDL, VLDL, HDL, and chylomicrons. And the difference is, oh, plus your stuff in the middle. The difference is the ratio. In role. Right? The role of the, compo, the lipoprotein comes from its structure. Think back to like your anatomy class. I've even heard this said during lecture, right? The, the function comes from its structure, right? The job here works the same way. The function comes from its structure. Is it more protein than phospholipid? Is it more phospholipid than protein? Is it pretty much even? Right? What does it do in the body? And also make a note to yourself that this is what's your measure during your cholesterol test. Right? This is what your doctor's measuring in a cholesterol test. How much LDL do you have? How much VLDL? How much HDL? How much chylomicron? Not this actual steroid molecule. So like I said, with the lipids, there's a lot of memorization because we're not learning specific reactions. It's not like we're you know, talking about a specific reaction and its catalyst and how to predict the product or anything like that, right? We kind of feel more like we're in a biology cluster <laughs> during this. So when we do enrichment on this, obviously I'm gonna take this information and I'm gonna put it into questions that would require you to use this information to come up with a reasonable answer. How do you feel about this right now? Kind of overwhelmed, probably. Uh, so that's where we're going to stop for today. And I'll see you Wednesday.